Hi, Lewis. <laughs> 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 we're normally much more professional when I we feel have like we're, I'm we're, so sorry we're... Hey, welcome to Beer Christianity My name's John T I'm Laura I'm Malky And I'm Liz Hey, hey. Liz Welcome to hey, the hey. show We've just been chatting to Liz beforehand um, uh, Laura was trying to get some of the gushing out Because she's a big fan of <laughs> the reason why we're going to be talking to Liz Although now I realise as I'm saying it, it makes it sound like what we're going to be talking about is patriarchy. Laura is not a big fan of patriarchy, that, and neither no. is Liz, which you're going to discover immediately. So don't switch off yet. Uh, Liz, you've written a book which Laura has devoured in days, um, and that I am a, a painfully short amount of the way through. But I have scanned a lot, um, <laughs> and I've listened to I've listened to podcasts about the book. You know, so <laughs> we've each done our own thing. thing. <laughs> we've, but I've put in the most amount of effort. Well, actually, Liz, you've put in the most amount of effort. Liz, you're the I one think... who actually wrote the book. Technically, <laughs> Liz wins. <laughs> but you all put in a good effort, it sounds like. Thank you. Well, would you like to tell us a little bit about the book um, and why you wrote it? Yeah, so the book is called Nice Churchy Patriarchy, Reclaiming Women's Humanity from Evangelicalism. Um, so as Jaunty said, not a fan of patriarchy. Um, and I spent a long time in my young adult life um, in complementarian churches and churches that had these kind of explicit patriarchal rules about what women were and were not supposed to do and who women were were not supposed to be. Um, and then I spent some time in the egalitarian church world where things are equal in theory, but not always in practice. So this book is a lot of reflections on those experiences and a lot of thoughts about how churches and faith communities could do better for women and better for gender equality and really better for everybody. And I think one of the most interesting things um, about your book and your experience is the fact that uh, in the churches that kind of think of themselves as not patriarchal, you have, you still have quite a lot of patriarchy and you have quite a lot of uh, negative experiences for women. Um, there's so much to kind of unpack in that, um, as well as obviously in the more kind of traditionally patriarchal things. I guess my question is, uh, one of the things that struck me in your book, which you mentioned quite early on, is that these can be quite nice people um, who are perpetuating this. How how do you deal with that as you try to fight the system, uh, you know, while perhaps even liking the people? Yeah, totally. I mean, I think that's one of the biggest tensions or challenges I've felt in writing the book. Um, and I think I just have to keep reminding myself and I want to keep reminding others who are in this struggle that we're not fighting against particular people. We're not fighting against men. We're fighting against these patriarchal systems that are actually not serving anybody um, and included. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think in terms of like Christian speak, it might be helpful to think of it in terms of powers and principalities and kind of the forces that rule our world. And patriarchy is one of those, along with white supremacy and a lot of other things. Um, and these are the things that we're struggling against. We want to make a world um, where everybody is seen and treated as equal, where people learn to share power together across gender and race and everything else. So. Um, I think it's helpful to kind of keep our eyes on that vision and that world that we want to build. Um, we want as many people along in that journey as possible. Um, so it's something that we work toward together. And yes, nice people are caught up in systems that are not working. Um, I have been one of those nice people caught up in systems that are not working. And I think there's room for all of us to grow and change. Yeah, I, I feel like when I, I'd love to ask you about kind of how, why this is the time for for a book like your book because I think for me um having been in kind of a, I've always been I feel like I've been in a weird space with feminism recently in that I I have always kind of you know I grew up as a kind of like third wave feminism kind of really in that space and then as I've kind of grown a bit older kind of struggled with the kind of um uh, white feminist is kind of the way I would describe it, like aspect of that, and I've maybe grown away from it. And I, I actually, mm -hmm. I found myself a little bit apprehensive to even pick up the book, which I was impl completely wrong about, because actually I loved the ways that you brought in different perspectives of women of colour and things like that. So, yeah, I wondered if you could maybe talk into it a bit about that, about kind of speaking to that space in, in the times that we are in. 
Yeah, that's fair. That hesitance is totally fair. Um, I think that it's really easy for women who are white, who are socioeconomically privileged, who are often straight, um, to fall into this historical trend of white feminism, like you said, that has really only advocated for a very particular type of woman and a very particular type of women's rights. Um, and that's probably part of my journey and what I might default to as well if I weren't intentionally trying not to. So yeah, my hope is that the book reflects some of that journey of really wanting to pursue a kind of feminism that advocates for and with all women. Um, and I feel like I've learned a lot from women of color on this journey. Um, Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde from a few, I was going to say a few decades ago, that's not quite right. Um, but yeah, if not exactly modern. Um, they've really helped me learn a lot and have said a lot of things that are still very much relevant today, um, as well as people who are currently writing. So yeah, that's, that's been a journey. Um, it helps that I'm a part of a multi-ethnic church now, and that's always a learning curve in a good way for me. So, yeah. And uh, maybe even going a little bit further back um, in terms of that journey, I don't know how many of our listeners, I think they tend to be pretty much on, on board with the the kind of left wing and progressive side of things. But I, I imagine a lot of us has, have come from um, patriarchal churches, complementarian churches, actually anti-women churches. Um, it, from a Christian perspective, from somebody who wants to, you know, you always get that question of like, oh, sure, you can go with the world, but, um, you know, what about this is Christian? What about feminism is Christian? Um, and I think that's often a bad faith question, but I think there's also a lot of people who who are concerned with that in good faith. And and to the, the people who'd ask it in good faith, well, what would you say? Yeah, um, totally. I think that's a good question when asked in good faith. Yeah. Um, and I think that our world, or at least the dominant white Western cultures that many of us live in, is very much set up in patriarchal ways. I mean, I've shared this book with friends who say, yeah, I see that in my workplace. That's not a Christian workplace, right? I see that in my family. I see that in my friendships and relationships. Um, so I think that there's a lot of ways that our world is, is very male dominated and you don't have to look much farther than politics and politicians to see that. Um, a lot of men in positions of power, um, a lot of women facing a lot of sexist sexist backlash when they pursue positions of power. Um, so I think that this is how our world is set up and the church goes along with it and sometimes perpetuates it even more than surrounding cultures. But really, it's not like the church is doing anything new or different. Um, and I think Beth Allison Barr's book, The Making of Biblical Womanhood, really helps bring that home. And she goes into a lot of the history around that and the Greco-Roman cultures that the Bible was written into and for, um, and the medieval context of church communities. And um, so I think it's helpful to wrap our heads around some of that history that usually patriarchal forms of Christianity have followed along with dominant patriarchal cultures, as opposed to like, this is what Christianity is or has to be or is supposed to be. And I'd love to ask you about how we, how we, um, make sure that when we're looking at scripture through a feminist lens we don't use that to where do kind of where do we draw our limits with that and we're not using it to abuse scripture in that way so the example that i thought of when reading the book was the um connection you drew between the um oh i'm gonna get this wrong now come on memory um the your will be done in the in the lord's prayer and the kind of similarities between that and the samaritan woman who um asked uh, uh jesus to heal her daughter and it's the kind of um who would eat the crumbs off the table story you can you know what we're talking about. You can look it up. Um, not you, Liz, the listener. <laughs> <laughs> so rude. <laughs> look so at our place. So right. The Bible. So Have you right. heard yeah, of it? But the similarities between what Jesus says to her then is the kind of let your will be done as you let it be done as you will it, and the kind of link similarity between your will be done 
And I, I loved that similarity in terms of the, the understanding that our will and God's will does align, um, you know, sometimes, but sometimes it doesn't. And how do we, how do we kind of use these kind of good and new ways of viewing scripture, but not take it too far? Yeah, that's a good question. I think what I love about that story is that what that Canaanite woman who comes to Jesus wants is healing and she wants, she wants justice. She wants acknowledgement um, that she is worth the scraps that fall from the table and more. (laughs) Um, She talks with Jesus as an equal across barriers of ethnicity and gender and power dynamics. Um, So I think that Yeah, it's not the case that always what we want is what God wants, but sometimes it is. Sometimes we want healing. Often we want at our deepest levels, healing and justice and equality, um, friendships, people who treat us as equals and who we treat as our equals. And so I think that it's really affirming to hear Jesus say to her, God wants what you want. And I think that sometimes God says that to us too. Um, especially for people who um, have been socialized to believe that our desires are always in conflict with God's desires, Um, kind of that more of God, less of me, Um, what I want must be different from what God wants. Um, And I do think there's, there's times when it's good to pray like Jesus does in the garden, your will be done, not mine. But I think we don't want to assume that our will is not lining up with God's. Um, so I think that takes discernment. I think it's it's a harder process and a longer journey than just kind of assuming that what we want is not what God wants. But I think it's good. And it's part of what makes us fully human to know that we have that agency to sort through our desires and think about what is good and what is not. And to ask ourselves whether those things that we want are good for us and for the people around us and for all people and to really think through those things for ourselves. I think that's our calling. Where do you think that comes from then? Like the just the notion because I guess I um I was interested in hearing some of your story in terms of um you well, I'll put words in my mouth rather than in your mouth. Certainly as I <laughs> as I went off to university, I became like more conservative and um kind of was drawn to Calvinism. I was in a, a, a more conservative church than I was growing up. Um and I hear that's a similar reflection that actually your parents are pretty chilled out and progressive <laughs> um, compared to the church that you joined. Um, so w- is that is that part of the picture where do we get that from culture? Do we get that from Bible in terms of God as as a sort of uh, oppressive character and, and us being, un, you know, learning not to trust ourselves, not to trust our intuition? Yeah, I think we often get that from church leaders who would rather have people not trusting their own intuitions because then they're easier to control. And that might not be fair, and it's definitely not true in all cases. Um, But I do think that's often the culture of evangelical churches, and that's what gets passed down from the higher ranks of them to the lower ones. Um, And I mean, I think so, for example, at the church that I went to in my 20s, as you all mentioned, full of good people, nice people, well-intentioned people. I don't think that anyone in that church in particular intended to control or to manipulate. Um, But when people get the idea that their desires and wants are not to be trusted, then that really opens the door for that, whether or not it's intentional. Um, We go looking for some authority figure to tell us what to do, how to be, who to vote for, what to care about. And I think that's all very dangerous. And that's super toxic, I think, as a philosophy, because it, you know, if your tendency is to want to suffer to prove your worth, then you're going to really go hard at it. If your tendency is to want other people to suffer, you're going to use it and really, it, it can be really bad. But, but do you think there's also an element of like in that, um, Bible story about the woman who, you know, gets, you know, asked for the table scraps, um, that if you're in an oppressed group, if you're in a marginalized group, your expectations are so low that you're willing to accept so little. And it almost, um, 
weaponizes your not your trauma i don't want to overuse that word but 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 that kind of cultural trauma against people and then the church goes along with it with like see see how happy they are with this yeah i think so and i go into in the book a little bit how i went to a church that called itself soft complementarian which I think for a while, I really did feel like, okay, within this world of conservative evangelicalism, this church is not the worst. And that's totally true. Um, but I think over time, I began to feel like saying we're soft complementarian. We let women do certain things, serve as pastors in some ways, um, in my context, just not as elders and not as regular preachers. Uh, I think over time, I began to feel like no, that's still not okay. We can't just look at those hard complementarian churches over there and say we have it better. Um, we really deserve more than that. And the church deserves more than that. The church deserves people operating in their gifts and being fully who God created them to be. I mean, this may be a, a controversial question, but can you imagine a reimagined complementarianism that was healthy? Is there such a thing as a healthy complementarianism? Because I've known people who were like genuinely not wanting to use it to oppress. They wanted to, I mean, they probably were going in that quite unhealthy, sacrificial kind of, you know, I will, I will suffer in order to do that. But, but could you, I mean, for myself, I'm not sure about gender existing. So I, I don't know, but, but could, but, but if gender did exist, could there be a good complementarianism? I do not think so. I do think that it, it works or it feels like it works for some people. But if church is only working for some people, that's not good enough. I want it to work for everybody, to include everybody, to let everybody be fully who they are, male, female, non-binary, everything, right? People don't believe in gender. Like the church should be that place where everyone feels at home and feels that they can be who they are. I think one of the great, this is, <laughs> I was going to say, this is actually, this is so, I, I don't mean this, but I do for myself mean that one of the great things that complementarianism has done, the worst things is that I never get to go to a freaking spa day, you know, than the church. It's always the women's day is the church. I don't want to go to a fucking men's breakfast. I mean, breakfast is fine, but must it be men? Like I just, do you know what I mean? And then, and then the women's day is like, you're getting your nails done and you're getting a massage and you're going to a spa. And I'm like, no, my wife is going absolutely not under no circumstances. Take me to the breakfast, which is <laughs> unhelpful. Um, Anyway, <laughs> we should yeah. probably also, since I, sorry, go. Yes. Hi. No, I mean, I, I totally agree that whenever gendered events are segregated in those ways, they're not going to be a good fit for everybody. And there's a lot of assumptions about what men and women enjoy or don't enjoy. Yeah. You don't have to be, you know, you could be a complementarian and still go, I I like massages. I don't understand. Like I, I, right. When I was a complementarian, I liked massages and wanted oh. to hang out with women, not just men. No, you don't, Jonte. You like monster trucks and barbecues. Oh, and bacon. I, mean, I, I fucking and love barbecues it. and bacon. <laughs> and monster trucks are pretty cool. But, you know, like, so is wearing dresses. So I don't know, man. <laughs> That's, you I can't do that at monster suits. Yeah, I contend not to do it. Amen. <laughs> hey, this is um, a good moment to ask what people are drinking. Um, because um, I got given a gift that somebody, a friend of mine went to Canada and brought it all the way back from Canada. And look how pretty it is. I don't know if That's you can right. see. Ooh. Isn't that nice? And it's kind of appropriate because it's called, well, it's called Naughty Hildegard, but I think it's naughty because it has alcohol in it. I don't think it's some kind of creepy thing. And it says, Bruton, a Hildegard von Bingen, a 12th century Benedictine abbess, composer, and writer who is considered the founder of scientific natural history in Germany. Her treatise on medicine Physica Sacra contains the first recorded use of hops as a preservative in beer. Uh, this ESB is strong, generally uh, what generously hopped for Hildegard. I don't know what an ESB is. What's an ESB? Does anybody know what an ESB is? No. <laughs> We're a beer podcast. Like isn't that something to do with like ghosts? What's the thing we yes, like, no, ghost hunt? Yes, yes. Really. <laughs> I mean, that's weird. I don't understand what it has to uh, anyway. Thank you very much, James, yeah. for this beer. It is actually delicious. So, um, um, is this the same Hildegard that is mentioned in the book, Viz? 
It absolutely is. Yeah. No way. Yeah. I didn't know, yeah. I didn't know I that connection that. to hops though. So learning. Yeah. Amazing. Wait, what, 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 what is the connection in the book? Um, so she was one of the women I learned about in my women in church history courses in seminary, um, who was just a total unexpected all around badass, like you just read about. Um, and one of the things I thought was especially striking was that she apparently served as an advisor to the Pope, um, which I thought was very interesting. It's not exactly being in that papal position of power, but being somebody who the Pope listened to and respected in a way that sometimes men don't listen to and respect women in the 21st century. So, yeah. Um, Malky, what you drinking? I am actually drinking alcohol. Well- um, because I didn't have any non-alcoholic beer in the house, so I've resorted to whiskey. But just, it's only a small amount. I just love the listening. idea that Liz is like, is he just falling off the wagon just for this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> Am I witnessing <laughs> something quite unhealthy? <laughs> John piece some posters on the wall. He's just like... <laughs> I'm all over the place. All over the place. Um, but... Um, I know more, well, I still don't know much about whiskey, but I know more about whiskey than I do about beer. Enough to name what I'm drinking, <laughs> being a Highland Park, which is distilled in Orkney. Nice, where you used uh, to live. Yeah. Nice. Excellent. Uh, Laura, what are you drinking? I'm drinking a can of Thatcher's Haze, because I bought a four-pack the last time we recorded the podcast, and I thought, ah, got a few. These are lined up, so I'll pop a load in the fridge. Although the one that we had after that was actually the one that we recorded in the morning. Mm. So I, I did not drink it then because it was seven o'clock in the morning. Yeah, I still have the beer that I had there that I almost opened at seven o'clock in the morning, but I, I have not. It's now warm and I'm not going to drink it. It's not good. Not- Liz, what are you drinking? Well, it's about 1 p.m., 1 in the afternoon over here in Seattle. Shots, shots, so. shots, shots. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that comes after the podcast. Just kidding. Um, for now. <laughs> off the <to> party. <laughs> I have a green tea with nice. ginger and yuzu flavors. It's delightful. I mean, that's way more hardcore than what we're drinking, to be fair. So, um, yeah, I think that's absolutely fair. <laughs> That's what uh, we're going for, hardcore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hardcore. That's that's it. That's the whole that's the whole vibe. You picked it yeah. up, right? Uh Malky, you got a question. Yeah, well I don't. It's one of my usual rambly comments. There may be oh, a is this like again. a man in the question section at a conference? I, it's yeah. it's, it's more, more of a comment. Um... More of a comment. <laughs> um, <laughs> um and since I've not actually read the book, I've heard you talking about the book then I'll probably just talk about stuff that you've mentioned in the book anyway. Um, But just off the back of what what we were discussing, uh, I think this is my own personal battle at the moment, like this idea that I've not trusted myself at all um, for many reasons. Um, And I'm trying to re-find myself and and sort of find, um, yeah, that tap into that intuition and believe that it's good and believe that God is in there as well. Um, but I think, yeah, just on this issue, I think it's one of those things that has helped me disconnect from myself in an unhealthy way, um, having this teaching in churches, because it's one of those things that um, to be taught kind of complementarianism um, really flies in the face of experience that I see around the place elsewhere and, you know, in work and um, like on the television now and politics, you know, women are everywhere. <laughs> no. um, but, you know, such progress made in other spheres. And just, you know, you know, of course, this woman's doing a fantastic job. And and then you end up getting in this weird logic when you're trying to explain, oh, no, there's some mysterious spiritual. Yeah, women are great and they can teach and they're real smart. But uh, there's some weird spiritual rule that in church, for some reason, no. I, like just... And and clearly it's the conclusions that you've drawn, but like, how can that not lead to a woman can't be trusted or, you know, their opinions can't be trusted. They can't be trusted to teach or they can maybe (laughs) teach other women or children for some reason, but certainly not men. Um, So that's the end of my comment. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, I think what you see a lot of times like complementary in churches or at least places that I've been involved in is people start with scripture and try to say, this is what scripture says. They point to a few particular passages that Paul wrote where it sounds like he's trying to limit women's roles. But then when you dig deeper and hear why this continues and why we haven't been willing to re-examine those passages, yeah, you hear people say some things. Like I've heard I've heard people say that men are more rational than women and therefore should be leading, um, things like that. There's a story early on in the book that I reflect on of a time where um, a man was kind of like, giving women what they want is not always what's best for them in response to suggesting that if women want to lead or preach, they should be able to. Um, so yeah, you get these really sexist ideologies that have kind of been formed to justify this system um, that is supposedly based on the Bible, but also has all this other baggage with it. So yeah. I think one of the bits of your book that I found so relevant and like so like liberating was your comments on um, the the kind of our oh, women are too emotional to do this and and da da da, and I just absolutely loved the way you flipped that as the kind of like why can't we be emotional about it like why can't we have that emotional connection to it and that just freaking blew my mind and I loved it but because I think for me I've always really struggled with the kind of the need to be able to have a defense for everything. And like, mm -hmm. it feels like there's a lot of pressure because I saw so context. I've just, um, over the summer, I've just left a complementarian church that um, I kind of was in because of the, the pandemic and I had a really good community there and they're really great people, but um, mm -hmm. I just didn't, um, yeah, it, I didn't really agree with them and you know that's kind of why I left. And I think that's probably why like I found your book so like resident for me. Um, but yeah, and that was kind of my question of like, you know, is it okay to not have a kind of theological defense for everything? Because I feel like, I, you know, I, when I was in that church, kind of being able to be like, I didn't feel like I was able to speak up about um, things that I believed because these are people who have theology degrees. These are people who have been preaching for, for decades. I'm not going to win in a, in a, battle of theologies and that in the battle of scriptures you know like so yeah what's your thoughts on that yeah i feel like there's a lot in there one of the things being that i wish that theology didn't feel like a battle i wish it felt like we're all figuring things out together and everyone has wisdom to offer and a say to offer whether or not they have a theology degree or anything like that um yeah, and I think it also raises the question, like you said, of what goes into theology. Is it just rational thought? Is it just scripture? It, or is it also all of who we are? Can we bring our emotions and intuitions into it? And I definitely think it should be or want it to be the latter. Um because, yeah, theology is just what we think about God, right? So it's this very general thing that most people can relate to, like most people think about God or spirituality in some sense, whatever that means to them. Um, so yeah, what does it even mean to have a theology degree? <laughs> like That can be helpful in some ways, but not if it's used to trample over other people's experiences of God. Um, so yeah, I mean, when people say that women are more emotional, um, it's kind of like, well, all humans have emotions, people of all genders have emotions. Men have often been socialized to squash those emotions and pretend they don't exist, except maybe anger. <laughs> and How dare you? Yeah, <laughs> that's not healthy for anybody. Um, so, I think <clears throat> so. Uh, for me, I think I probably have some sympathy for if I want to be generous about not the women are emotional because that's obviously insane because you see men literally punching each other in the face every weekend in every country in the world and the holes in that drywall are, yeah. are not from women generally so like in terms and, of and also the downfall of men like so much talks like you like you look at mark driscoll seattle's own mark driscoll i think or his church was there wasn't it um yep. you know his well i was gonna say his downfall he's risen up again and still you know 
but anyway, a lot of that was, you know, bullying and egotistical and wounded pride and, and narcissism. Like that's just different emotions. That that's not called emotions. rationality at yeah. all. <laughs> but right. but I do have some sympathy for people who are like, you know, like your your feelings are not necessary. I don't want to say facts don't care about your feelings because I hate those people, obviously, as we all should, our men. But like, I think I think there is something about wanting to come to truth that you don't like um and that isn't as subjective but i think for me that's quite important because that was key to me coming from an unchurched background becoming a christian was like oh i hate this religion this is awful um but it it seems to be true and the concept of that there might be some kind of truth that is not mediated subjectively um just just so again i've been to a lot of pentecostal churches and we are insane and like that stuff is not curbed you know and it would be really helpful if it was sometimes by something more objective you know what i mean i don't know is that is that is that just part of a kind of just deeper patriarchal mindset or or do you have any kind of sympathy for that well, you can say sure. you can say it is. I won't. I won't take offense. You think that is just straight up patriarchal bullshit? I can see on your face. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think. I mean, I wouldn't say that there's no such thing as objective truth. Just that none of us are are objective in the way that we approach it, and there's been a lot of harm done. Um, by certain white men usually who think that they have the objective truth and everyone else needs to conform to it so yeah i wouldn't necessarily say there isn't such a thing more just like we come to truth by bringing everyone's different perspectives sometimes we do all have different truths um if there are objective truths there's not like a ton of specifics that we can say about it like if you have a 20 page belief statement like that's, I wouldn't say that that's objective truth. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's complicated. And for people who are in um, churches where they're not maybe, cause you know, there are some churches that have just decided this is one of the hills they're gonna die on. They are going to fight against anything feminist and you know, the vast majority of the church are just fully on board with that. But there's a whole bunch of them that haven't really decided that this is their battle, which is where we could probably win some ground, right? Um, <laughs> What do you say to somebody who's just not sure about this stuff, who's in a church that is definitely not feminist, but they don't think of as having a particularly hard kind of line on this stuff, but who's been kind of bumbling along in this way, a man or a woman, um, and just think, oh, it's fine. It's not worth making a fuss of it. Like, why is this so important? Yeah, I think I bumbled along in that way for a while, thinking I don't really agree with her my, where my church stands on these things, but it doesn't seem worth making a fuss about. I see where people are coming from. Um, and I would say that I look back now and think that that's not sustainable. I think that it's often coming out of a place of conflict aversion or aversion to tension or aversion to change. And I think that when churches are in that place where women are not treated fully as equals or when there's any group who's not treated fully as equals, it can feel easier to just bumble along and stay there. It can feel a lot more difficult to reconsider. Um, but I think it that often ignores the cost of the present ways of doing things. Um, it often ignores the experiences of women or queer people or whoever is kind of on the underside of these, these structures, patriarchal or otherwise. Um, so yeah, I would say that it is worth having conversations about, it's worth, um, being attentive to the way that those conversations happen and whose voices are centered in that process. Um, and I think that churches really do themselves a disservice when they aren't open to everybody freely being who they are and freely using their gifts. So I think it is worth considering, even if it doesn't seem like there's a cost to it, there is. That's and, oh, sorry. Where are you gonna go? You go, Jonte. So that that's just, that's incredibly gracious, um, and 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 you are so winsome in your book as well about this stuff. But but almost this is quite important because it's really hurting people. 
Yes. It's it's damaging people. And even from the kind of mindset that I think likes the complementarian argument of, because I've heard that a lot of, you know, if a man won't step up, then a woman has to, and that's wrong. Um, and I, you know, me discovering that my wife is more talented in almost fucking everything than I am. And so I've been holding her back was a fairly horrifying realization because we were complementarians. But like, we're missing out on so much, just pragmatically, we're missing out on so much talent and potentially so much righteousness, holiness, prophecy, whatever your kind of church is valuing, you're missing out on almost half of it if it's not valuing women. Like, yeah. like, and, and I, and I guess that's, that's kind of the position that I would hold, but is that unhelpful? Does that kind of, be, cause, cause it's quite combative maybe, I don't know. Is that like, how, how should we be approaching this? I think that's a totally valid position to hold. And I totally agree. Um, I think, I mean, I think for me, that's the truth and it needs to be spoken. And for everybody who has experienced that harm, I want those voices to be heard. Um, is that the most effective way to reach people who are not quite convinced? I don't know. But I mean, <laughs> I feel like voices on the underside of these power structures need to be heard. And um, my hope is that people who maintain these power structures will become open to hearing. Um, and if they're not, I don't know what's going to convince them. So, yeah, I think one of the things I hope to do in the book is help women especially embrace their agency to speak up about these things that are causing harm, um, both to women and to the whole community, to the whole church, um, and also to encourage people to be willing to leave those spaces if they need to. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think I want to encourage people that that is okay if those spaces aren't open to change um, or if they just aren't healthy spaces and women need to leave. That is very much our right to do so. We're not disappointing God. We're not being disloyal to people. Um, we're choosing to honor ourselves as people made in God's image and to honor other women as that. And would you say that there's a, I don't want to say difference in damages, I don't seem the quite right term, but I feel like there is a there is a difference between churches that kind of take that kind of more active, shall we say, kind of complementarian view where it's like, you, the moment you step in the door, you know what the deal is and they're, they're pretty open. It's like, this is da da da. But then there are other churches, probably more likely, I think, egalitarian churches who don't shout about the fact that they are egalitarian and do offer these opportunities to women and maybe potentially see themselves as it's kind of like the job is already done and we almost don't need to kind of push for, for more. Um, yeah, would you say that that's I don't know. I don't think it's probably unlikely to be just as damaging an environment as it is would be in a hard complementary church. But is is there some kind of damage that can be done in that environment as well? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think that when I finally left the complementary church that I went to for most of my 20s um, and moved across the state to go to seminary, got involved in a different church that was egalitarian, I think for me at first, it was kind of like, this is awesome. There's no explicit limitations placed on women in these contexts. I have female professors. I see women preaching. This is great. Um, and I think it took me a while to realize that not everything was great in those spaces either, and that it was often hard to be a woman still in those spaces. So yeah, I do think that there's still damage done by the patriarchy that lingers in those spaces that, that don't want it there, but it's still there. Um, and I think that, I mean, at least in those spaces, there's the hope of having some conversations about it where everyone in theory wants the same thing and we can figure out how to work toward it together. In practice, that can be hard. Um, yeah, so I think it's complicated. I think the, the kind of harm that's done is different. Um, I would personally rather be in a space that at least in theory affirms women, even if we're not quite there yet. Um, I would rather rather be in a space that is more fully there. Um, so I think it matters if there's openness to change, if there's openness to being on a journey, if there's openness to realizing we're not quite there and and asking women or other marginalized people, what can we do to get there? Yeah. And I think that journey even just the language man like i think back to my old old churches and just things were either biblical or not 
<laughs> you know, right. even the, I think in my, the more conservative circles, I probably didn't even hear the term complementarium. It was just biblical. And, sure. you know, there might be mad liberal churches out there, but they are unbiblical. Um, so also, like, in, in, in that journey, um, can you give us uh, some examples of the, the more subtle f- stuff that you faced or the, the kind of pitfalls that those folks might fall into um, where kind of um, the blind blind spots that we have, um, kind of especially men coming from that perspective, trying try our darndest to be, uh, to be uh, progressive, but missing. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so many things where to start. <laughs> well, I mean, in the book, I share stories about a few of my seminary professors who were really wonderful men who were very affirming of women in ministry and all that. And yet, who would sometimes make kind of careless comments in class um, that really didn't help me as a woman feel comfortable in seminary, in seminary environment. Um, So, I mean, I'm thinking of things like a professor who told a story about a man at a former church who was like a big like drug dealer, like violent, all around bad guy, and then converted to Christianity and his whole life changed. It isn't that wonderful. He never really quite figured out how to treat women, but it was this like happy conversion story where everything changed. And that was just kind of a line that was thrown in there for laughs, I think. Wow. Um, And I mean, I'm laughing because what else are you going to do? But to me, that was not funny. Um, And I'm sitting there as a woman in seminary looking around being like, does anybody else have a problem with this? I'm not sure. I can't really tell. Um, But yeah, so comments like that that are kind of thrown in um, for a laugh or just to make a story a little more colorful. Um, And I mean, obviously, we all make careless comments that we then regret. (laughs) Um, that's a very human thing to do. At the same time, when you're teaching a class in seminary, that's really a position of power. And you're setting an example of what your seminary students should be when they become pastors. Um, You're setting the tone of how women are or are not being valued and how men should or shouldn't value women or what kind of priority that should have. So um, that's just one example. But I think yeah, watching those kinds of comments. Um, there are also some more, I don't want to say serious, because that is serious, but kind of uh, more weighty, I guess, examples in the book um, of pastors not believing women in their congregation who were concerned about being harmed by a particular man who was visiting. Um, and those those are really weighty things. I think all the ways that that women's voices are often dismissed or women's concerns are dismissed, and that happens in all sorts of environments, not just explicitly patriarchal ones. What should men who are listening to this who feel like they want to, you know, what at, at whatever point they're at, they want to do more, they want to go further? What what do we need to do? Yeah, well, thanks. Totally thanks. I'll take that, John T. Yeah. The most important <laughs> thing is <laughs> pipe yeah. down this. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Yes, interrupting women <laughs> yeah, is uh, <laughs> always the way to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think it, it depends very much on the context and where the community is at and where people in the community are at. I think. Um, I think often men or anyone who is in positions of power really needs to figure out how to share that power. Um, And so, yeah, if there's a male pastor in a church, figuring out how to bring in as many women elders as possible or women preachers as possible and kind of trying to even out that power balance. Um, Asking women for feedback proactively, I think is a good thing because sometimes uh, you know, there might be things that we feel frustrated with or or comments that were made that we didn't appreciate, but it's hard to bring those things up and we don't know how it'll be received. So I think proactively asking, like, how are we doing gender equality wise? How comfortable do you feel as a woman in this church? What would make you feel more comfortable? Um, do you feel like you have space to express all of your gifts? Are there gifts you want to explore that you haven't been able to? All those kinds of questions, I think, just can bring up really good conversations and it's helpful if men initiate those. Um, I, I have another question just because we've been talking quite a lot about um, 
Palestine. I don't want to. I don't want to make a direct link there, except you know, the uh, you know, the people of Gaza are still being slaughtered by uh, the Israeli Defense Force. So, Free Palestine, just to be clear. Um, but also, uh, a lot of right wingers, I think, have found a way to co opt feminist language in their Islamophobia. Um, particularly with things like um, the wearing of um, a hijab, for instance, um, which I know in a lot of contexts is not done by choice, but in some contexts is very much done by choice by women as an expression of their faith. And I guess as Christians interacting with people of other faiths, uh, do you have any advice for how our feminism can avoid being imperialist, white supremacist, colonialist, uh, pet, uh, patronizing um, and paternalistic rather than necessarily patriarchal? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, without being an expert on any of these things, um, I would suggest sticking with our own cultures and contexts and trying to make things better and more equal here, <laughs> as opposed to trying to do that in cultures and contexts that we don't know much about. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And if there are feminists um, speaking up in those contexts and pushing for change, I think we can support and we amplify their voices and probably shouldn't be speaking for them or over them. Yeah. And just to, uh, in addition to that, of how do we keep our kind of feminism separate from being infected by capitalism. So I think that is something that I have really struggled with when I when I talk about my distance from feminism. I think that's something I really um yeah, have really struggled with over the last few years as I've become kind of, you know, disillusioned with our capitalist structures. How do we make that distinction as well? Also a good question and not an easy one. Um I, I wrestle with that too, for sure. And I'm still wrestling with it. Um, I mean, I think it's just crucial to keep digging into all of the ways that these systems are connected together, um, patriarchy and capitalism and white supremacy and uh, materialism, classism, militarism. I feel like I'm going very Martin Luther King here, but he was right. <laughs> he was right about all. pretty much yes. everything that's going right. on. <laughs> all these things are very much intertwined. Um, and I think about that when you bring up Israel and Gaza as well, that, that, that culture of toxic masculinity and warlikeness and violence is very connected to patriarchy. Um, all sorts of colonialism and and some cultures expressing uh, violent dominance over others is also very connected to patriarchy. So, yeah, I think we're trying to dismantle all these things together. Hopefully, yeah. Um, in terms of uh, what you would like people to get out of the book and kind of why you write, because you you commit a hell of a lot of time when you're writing a book like this, and it's it's so in depth, it's so I think beautifully written and um, somehow dense with meaning without being um, uh, I what's the word like? It's not a scary book to read. It's not too dense to read. You don't wade through it like you do with some some theology books. But you also don't feel like fuck. This is so light. This and is a waste of time. I read it in four days. Four days. Yeah. <laughs> but you're smart, so that counts for nothing for other people. But like, like, Stop. yeah. I, I guess what would you want people to get out of the book? Like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think we've we've kind of touched on a lot of things in it. So I'm trying to think what to add. Um, Cause I do this think a it's stupid question. John T. No, <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> no. um, I think I would just reiterate that I really want to encourage women or other, just anybody who is not happy with the patriarchal way that things are to, to push for change and to embrace that agency, to try to change and also to embrace the agency to leave if needed. Um, so I think that's a huge thing for me. I think sometimes women feel some loyalty to these communities that are actually not serving them well, or we worry that we would be sinning against God if we left church. It's okay to leave church. It's okay to look for a different church that better serves all of its people. Um, it's okay to spend some time not going to church, right? God is not confined to the walls of any particular church building or any church building at all. So 
um, yeah, I think I want to encourage people to look for and find communities that work for them that are more encouraging than frustrating. Not that there's nothing frustrating about them, but that on the balance are healthy places where people can thrive. Yeah, because I mean they're still churches, right? So like you know, yeah. it's just, just you know, <laughs> there's uh, always something. There's <laughs> literally always something. Yeah. Um, uh, to people who are perhaps who have been either I don't want to say like they've been so damaged, but their experience has been so damaging that they feel that it is it has kind of ruined God for them. Um, I mean that's obviously incredibly sad, and I think another excellent reason why this kind of thinking should be dismantled. But but what would you say to those people about God that perhaps they've been lied to about in their church? Many things, many things. Um, oh, I mean, God is love, right? That's the core of it. So if whatever people have experienced of church or of teaching about God is not loving, and doesn't feel loving, um, that's not God, that's not right. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I totally understand if the idea of God or relating to God has been ruined for people. And I think I want people to know that there are lots of different kinds of expressions of Christianity out there. Um, I think sometimes conservative churches, uh, like you all said earlier, kind of look at those liberal churches askance and think that they aren't really Christian. That's not true. <laughs> um, so I think I want to encourage people to um, be open to the broadness of different expressions of Christian faith. But also, I mean, I'm not trying to make anyone go to church who doesn't want to go to church, right? It's okay um, if none of that resonates anymore because things have been so harmful. I totally get that. Um, and I mean, I think there are ways of finding a spirituality that works outside of Christianity, outside of particularly religious spaces. I think there's ways of connecting with people over spiritual questions and experiences that, um, that, they, don't, that don't have to do with church. So yeah, I think my hope is that people will find some expression of spirituality that feels and is safe and affirming and that genuinely feels life-giving for them. Um and connecting with the Bible as well, like have you found have you found kind of um new life in parts of the Bible or certain characters um that have become heroes for you? Yeah, I think there's a lot to the Bible that gets missed or overlooked or downplayed in a lot of conservative churches. Um, so I really enjoy all the stories about women that are often overlooked and downplayed. Um, I don't know if you all know Flamey Grant, but I'm kind of thinking of the Esther Ruth and Rahab song. <laughs> What's so Flamey are, Grant? I don't know this. What is what this? Is oh, yeah. <laughs> they're a drag artist who's become very popular, at least in the Flamey Grant. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's yes. amazing. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Love so that. she has a song called Esther, Ruth, and Rahab that talks about some of the women in the Bible that were their heroes growing up. Um, so that's kind of cool. But um, yeah, in the book, I get a little bit into some of those women in the Bible. Um, I think it's been especially meaningful for me to see in the New Testament how much women lead um, and how much they do and how even though Paul says the, thing he's, the things that he says in other places, he really does honor women and follow their leadership and calls Junia outstanding among the apostles and all that. Um I think of the story of Priscilla and Aquila, who were a, a wife and husband married team who taught the preacher Apollos. So they're basically like the kind of awesome female seminary professors that I had a few of, but wish I'd had more of in the 21st century. So I think it's, um, I think I find it liberating to see um, the kinds of roles that women do play in scripture if we're looking for it. And also, am I right in saying that Junia, like, <laughs> translations just straight up changed their name to yeah. to imply oh no this is a dude it must like my understanding. Oh, that was a leader so it must have been a guy <laughs> right right wow. several centuries later right like the the writers of the bible had no problem with it but later on yeah to be fair to them a lot of men who name their sons after them call them junior so that's a you know Boo. <laughs> Boo. 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 him. 
I love in the book where you go basically just go off about the women in Exodus and I particularly enjoy the mention of, I'm not going to remember their names, but the two midwives um, mm-hmm. in Exodus who are just brilliant. And I just, I think we actually reread this passage as a, when I was at my old church as a small group like months ago and just rereading that passage and being like, oh, this is civil disobedience. Like these are these are two women who are uh, completely ignoring the rules and just being like, no, I am not going to ch- kill children, and right. I'm going to save them. I was like, it's so good, like so good and so brave, and they lie about it when they have to, and yeah, yeah they have this moral compass that is different from what they're being told to yeah. do, and they follow it. Yeah, and when people mm-hmm. are like, oh, like Christians shouldn't break the law, like Christians like shouldn't like protest or something like that. It's like, have you read? <laughs> <laughs> about right. these women We're doing this from the beginning like oh man totally so good so good um we are coming towards the end of our time so i wanted to give you an opportunity just to tell people where they can find your book and is there other stuff that you would recommend that um they'd be reading like um of yourself or of other people like what what g- give us a, a just an off the cuff reading list watching list listening list whatever Sure. Um, well, I'll start with mine. So damn right, um, <laughs> Shit, definitely. It's available for pre-order. It comes out December first. Um, it's available for pre-order on Amazon. We have uh, it pre-release. Yeah, you got an advanced you copy. See, they're like not for resale. <laughs> banner on the cover of it yeah but i just assumed that that was just all comps like i had no idea oh very cool (laughs) very cool nice yeah so yeah it comes out december 1st um you can order it online on amazon barnes and noble or bookshop.org um i also share other things i write at lizcoolidgejenkins.com and on instagram as at lizcoolj um so reading list wise um, I'm going to go with some of the books that I feel like have really influenced how I've thought about faith and feminism over the last couple of years. Um, I really enjoyed Kristen Dumay's uh, Jesus and John Wayne. Um, I really enjoyed Cole Arthur Riley's This Here Flesh. Um, I enjoyed Christina Cleveland's God as a Black Woman. Um, yeah. I also really enjoyed Ijoma Oluo's work on kind of race and gender in general, not necessarily from a Christian perspective, but I thought that Mediocre um, was really good, as well as So You Want to Talk About Race. So those are a few, hopefully not too many. I would also want to big up uh, the amount of research and um, just dedication Liz has put into the book and not only regularly drawing on women of colour and uh, in your research, but also I think the five page reading recommended reading list at the end of the book which is just long. phenomenal and like is it like over half of the people the women on there are women of color yeah. um so really what you should do is is buy Liz's book and then just peruse the reading list at the end of it and get all of the inspiration from that but maybe the other stuff too but yeah all the other stuff too yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> back yourself Liz <laughs> yeah come on <laughs> sell 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 sell, sell. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for um, being on the show. And is there anything you'd finally like to leave people with? No, I think we covered all the things. So thank you so much for having me. This is great. Fantastic. This has been a delight. Uh, If you're new to the podcast, you can find us uh, beerchristianity.co.uk. And we haven't put all of the old episodes up. So if you want to find the other ones, it's beerchristianity.libsyn.org. Or if you Google Big Christianity Podcast, unfortunately, yeah, the first use... the, the first website that comes up is our old website. <laughs> so... Oh, not for me. Now for me, it's um, oh, it's UK. Beat so... the algorithm. But I mean, I'm sure the second listing that comes up is the old website, which has all of our old stuff on it. We also have a newsletter, uh, beerchristianity.substack.com. Uh, is that right? Or Substack? Or Beer- I don't know. Anyway, it's a Substack, right. you know, newsletter. If you want to read stuff about Lil John and Palestine, then, you know, that's that's the place for you. And you can find us on Insta and all the usual kind of social places. Email us your questions, your comments, beerchristianity at yahoo.com, because we old school like that. And thanks so much for listening. Bye! Bye! Bye. Bye.